Today, we seek to move beyond the accomplishments of the past, to establish the principle that all the people are entitled to a decent way of life. This is the most demanding goal of all. We have made a good start on our journey, but we have still a long way to go. The conquest of poverty is as difficult, if not more difficult, than the conquest of outer space. And we can expect moments of frustration and disappointment. But we have no doubt about the outcome. For all history shows that the effort to win progress represents the most determined and steadfast aspirations of man. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Dr. Yoda Tunwesje uh, in Shema district, southwestern Uganda. The, the major reason I started this medical clinic by and large is because in 1991 I lost my own brother due to AIDS at the time when we could not get AIDS care in our country. We needed the financing for this clinic uh, but we tried to get uh, money from various banks who were turned down mainly because of the rural area and in 2006 we were lucky uh, to get support from Nairo Bank uh, who accepted to give me uh, 80 million Uganda shillings to help establish state-of-the-art diagnostic facilities to recruit more staff and to provide AIDS care for over 4,600 uh, patients who are now living because of that loan. The DCA Guarantee Facility is a partnership where the US government shares risk with a commercial bank. So it's not US government money, it is local capital. My name is Wargaba John. I'm a businessman. I work with my wife. Here at the factory, we create mattresses, cakes, and bread. I tried to expand my business by acquiring a bigger loan, but I couldn't make it because I didn't have enough collateral. able to give financing to our customers who have insufficient collateral. John repaid his loan very well and the bank was able to increase his confidence in him. After the expiry of the guarantee, we are able to continue lending to small and medium enterprises.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome USAID's Assistant to the Administrator for the Bureau of Policy, Planning, and Learning, Susan Reichley. Welcome, everybody, to our third and final day of our Frontiers in Development Conference. We are just so pleased that all of you could join us today. And whether it's your first day here in Healy Hall or it's your third day, uh, we look forward to a really fascinating day to discuss not only the challenges of development, but most importantly, the solutions. Uh, on the first day, some of you may have heard that we had the opportunity to hear from five heads of state three former heads, uh, or two former heads, and three current heads of state, all of them women. And as Judy Woodruff pointed out, which was really interesting, of 187 countries in the world, only eight of them are led by women today. And as they and the panelists afterwards talked about the challenges of development and how democracy and security are interconnected, uh, we really came out, I think, that day's session really discussing about a new framework and that we really operate in a new development landscape. The second day focused on uh, a really jam-packed sessions on climate change to food security to uh, uh, health service delivery, delivery, and an overarching theme of resilience emerged from the day, which is quite, quite interesting because one of the things that USAID is working on right now is developing a resilience policy. So we want to thank all of you for your input during the day yesterday because it will definitely, uh, it, it was food for thought as we move forward on developing our own resilience policy. The day culminated actually in the launch of our grand challenge for development of powering agriculture with lots of our partners from the private sector to our minister of development in Sweden uh, here with us yesterday. So we look forward to today, which is an incredibly interesting day focusing on the future of development. And as we've been discussing over these last couple days, that development assistance has clearly changed. Uh, we've seen, obviously, the role of civil society, whether you're working within a formal NGO or an informal NGO, or youth who are here in the dorm rooms of Georgetown or overseas in, in universities who are participating in how to make the world a better place and how do we operate within that new development landscape. We saw the essay uh, from Secretary Clinton in our Frontiers in Development publication. We hope all of you have that here and those of you can access it online as well where she emphasized how much development has changed over the last 50 years. If we really look at overseas development assistance 50 years ago, it was 70% of the financial flows into least developed countries, and now it's less than 30%. So clearly a different development landscape that we're operating in, which really leads us into our first um, our first panels of the day, uh, which will be opened uh, with two dev talks. I'll introduce our guests in a moment, but our panel uh, on, uh, on the future of development assistance, which Nina Easton will be moderating from Fortune Magazine. We're really fortunate to have her here and listening to the panel backstage, they've already begun the dialogue. So that brings me to all of you here in the audience and most importantly online to please use the crowd hall. You can all participate. We've received hundreds of questions already online, uh, 50 answered. We're going to be today really using video cam and to make it as interactive as possible. So uh, those of you who are out there in the internet, please, uh, please enter in your questions here in the audience. Uh, you can please uh, look at your, not only the questions, but the answers on usa.crowdhall.com. Which now brings me to our uh, first speaker of the, of the morning, which, who is not actually on the agenda. He heard about this conference going on at Georgetown, and as he often does, uh, he says this is uh, important for development. He's uh, not only, uh, some know as the, uh, the national director of the Economic Council, uh, and also an author of some landmark books on girls' education, but he's someone who's truly committed to development and took time out of his busy schedule at the White House uh, to come here today uh, to spend time with all of us to talk about the importance of development and the future of development as we move forward. One um, unknown fact about our special guest, which I hope most of you know now in the room, is Gene Sperling. He also came 
over to USAID a couple months ago, and he participated in our launch of another grand challenge on all children reading. Uh, while he is known as an economist and advising presidents over the past decades, he has moonlighted on the importance of education to development. And he participated in a Jeopardy, com uh, Jeopardy competition with Alec Trebek, actually, moderating. And it wasn't for money. It was for Elmo dolls, which actually in the, his home, as well as our administrator home, administrator's home with young children, the Elmo doll dolls were worth a lot. And, and we just really thank him for his commitment, for understanding the importance of, uh, of not only education and girls' education, but development to really creating long-term uh, social and economic growth within a country. So please take a moment to welcome Jean Sperling to the stage. Uh, yes, it's true. Only in Washington, D.C., when somebody launches something for education um, in uh, um, uh, reading around the world and has Alec Trebek come, uh, we of course got into a fierce competition for who would in fact win the Elmo dolls. Um, I think I crushed them. Uh, I was very strong on my Olivia answers, particularly showed off a little uh, for those of you who are, uh, have a child at that age. Um, so uh, I don't want to hold up because we're going to get to the panel. I appreciate being offered the opportunity to, to uh, do one of the dev, dev talks, so to speak. And uh, as mentioned, I spent my eight years uh, in between uh, being in the Clinton White House and working for President Obama, uh, uh, founding the Center for Universal Education. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, helping to form the first U.S. chapter of the Global Campaign for Education and devoting myself to the issue of education in developing countries. And I will say that one of the questions that I got constantly and I went to form after form on was obviously uh, how do we uh, uh, essentially create the awareness, the message, how do we uh, uh, on something uh, that is fundamentally about people who, uh, 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 or most directly, uh, are outside our country, uh, who are not voters, they're not even in swing states, uh, they are outside our country. How do we uh, create the public awareness that we want? And, and I didn't have an answer as I started, but as I watched and I observed, and was part of the uh, uh, nonprofit development community, it really hit me the degree that there really was a, a, a three-part formula that is very powerful. And I think it's important to think through the, the dimensions of, of each one of those. And the three parts is essentially creating, number one, uh, finding your way of creating the awareness uh, to uh, finding your way to communicate and, uh, to people and create an awareness that this problem exists. Uh, number two, and critically, to show that there are successes happening that are covering, that are helping a small portion of that large problem. And by the combination of showing that large problem and that there are clear success, create the tension for the third step, which is the sense that there can be success uh, and more can be done. And, and I just wanted to say a word about how one gets to that third step. Now, being a person who's been part of presidential campaigns, et cetera, you're always taught what's your single message. And I think what's very complicated in development is that everybody who's been involved in this has tried to find out, is it national security? Is it fighting terrorism? Is it showing that there'll be economic growth that will benefit us? And yet, what you learn over and over again, and this is difficult, is that different things grab different people. Um, you, know, you get the movement that you have to show what is the self-interest of people in the United States. And yet, you will see over and over again uh, that often what has grabbed people to care about development uh, uh, goes beyond the data uh, and is spiritual or moral or a connection they feel uh, because it's girls being denied. And, uh, and it's very easy when you're in the academic data government side to focus so much on wanting to make the case for self-interest that you forget 
uh, that, that what grabs people is often diverse. And that's a challenge, and I don't have an easy answer to that, except to say that we have to be aware of that, and finding the single best message or answer in development may in fact leave out uh, a lot of the people who you may reach. I can think of one major Republican uh, uh, member of Congress who was moved simply by his local pastor. Uh, another who was moved by hearing that uh, seeing young people in developing countries thinking the United States was only about military power and wanting to show them uh, our compassion or heart. Uh, these were not things that fit into the playbook, uh, but they are part of the reality. And so number one, I think when we think about how to grab awareness, we have to in some way have a powerful message, but remember the diversity of personal emotional feelings that leads people to be grabbed to an issue. Um, uh, the second thing I would say on awareness is, uh, you know, and I'll give you an example. As we were putting together all the work and information and data on education in developing countries, I was always aware that nothing had helped us more than people just seeing little girls in Afghanistan not going to school. It wasn't our data. It wasn't the book I did on what works in girls' education. It was actually that they got to actually see real live girls who look like their daughters, who are the same age, wanting to go to school and being denied. And that struck people in a way that went beyond uh, our data. So for those who focus on bringing people to developing countries to see and experience what can be done, to those who spend their lives on documentaries, so those who can't travel can at least travel visually through watching a documentary and seeing real life people, I think that is a critical, critical part of the awareness part. Now the second part, the success part, is one that is very easy to forget. I was speaking the other day at a panel on uh, the most disconnected, hard to reach young people in the United States. Young minority men stuck in gangs, uh, completely disconnected uh, from school, etc. And I wanted to tell this group that had been working together, pulling together to advise the White House how serious the problem was, how great the challenge was. Uh, and I made a classic mistake. At the end, uh, the one man, celebrity, who had been devoting himself, came up to me and said, wow, I, I was hoping I'd motivated him. He said, I was feeling pretty good, but that, I feel really dark now. And, and I think that's very important. People respond to success. To overwhelm people with how terrible a, pro a challenge and a problem is, uh, is to create awareness that makes people decide to go mow their lawn because there's nothing they can do. It is when you create that awareness and say, but look here, here is a program that has been proven uh, with hard, rigorous data to work. Look, you can see the eyes of this young girl who is now gonna go to high school when no one in her family had ever gone to junior high. Look, here is the farmer who's now hired 10 people uh, and could have been destitute. Uh, it is that success that makes people think, well, there's something maybe we can do. And that's why, for example, I believe the USAID focus right now on making sure in education, the area I worked on, that you could show tangible, hard results on reading, while very focused, I think is the right thing. Because without that ability to show tangible, widespread success, people can lose confidence in the endeavor that we can help enough in girls' education, that our input can make as big a difference. So I think the second part is one that is just critical. Show success, show things can be better. That's part of your message, but that's part of the rigor and data that we have to do. And I think it is when you have created those two things together that you are at your maximum in the third step. You have created the awareness, you've been aware of how to appeal to people's heart and their head, and you've shown them now, look, it can get better. And there is the problem is this big, and look, this much of it is being solved by smart, interesting things done by devoted people, and that is what creates the tension of how can we let that remaining gap exist. So just a, a couple of overall thoughts for the day, uh, uh, and I will look forward to seeing you on the panel. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the Department of Economics at Georgetown University, Billy Jack. I think there's one more short. So there's one more three. Minutes. Thanks, and uh, I've never had such an introduction before in such a booming voice. Uh, <laughs> First of all, let me say thanks to Steve Radlett and uh, Administrator Shah for inviting me to give this talk. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a project that AID is helping us with uh, in Kenya. So mobile phones and mobile money, as we've heard a number of times in this conference, are revolutionising Africa. In Kenya, where the penetration rate is more than 70% now, and virtually all households have access to some kind of mobile device, the technology is impossible to escape. Pastoralists from the arid north use it, as do tea pluckers from in the fertile west. Sorry, I've got to get my slides up here. There you go, there's a pastoralist. There are some tea pluckers. Uh, affluent beachgoers don't leave home without it. And even the kids of Kibera are connected these days. So in this context, mobile apps promise to help solve a range of development problems, from increasing adherence to antiretroviral therapy, to reducing teacher absenteeism, from improving corporate governance to controlling government graft, and from paying for clean water to delivering maternal health care services and vouchers. But as well as being used to address specific and urgent problems of development such as these, can mobile technology grease the wheels of the economy as a whole? Simply put, can it help make people rich? To address this problem, or this question, my colleagues and I are investigating the role that mobile money can play in boosting the profitability of the small business sector. Small business is an important source of employment and income across the developing world, <coughs> especially in urban settings, but it's nonetheless held back by limited access to basic financial services, including crucial short-term loans. So with the support of AID and in collaboration with Equity Bank, one of the largest banks in Kenya, and uh, Nairobi Bottlers, the local producer of Coca-Cola products, we're exploring the potential for mobile money to fill this gap in the financial landscape by making transactions cheaper, safer, and easier to track. I also claim that this project is a... a <laughs> a safety project, because in some cases it's, it's safer to drink Coke than it is to drink the water. But that's not the objective, of course. Focusing on the retail sector in Nairobi, our partners have designed a new SMS-based trade credit product that operates on the bank's mobile platform, money platform and allows both distributors and retailers to better manage deliveries, stocks and finances all through a series of text messages. No longer will a retailer need to dig into her pockets to discover how much inventory she can produce, uh, she can purchase on a particular day when the truck arrives with the crates of Coke. Now she can access credit through her phone, decoupling the purchasing and financing decisions associated with running her business. Similarly, no longer will distributors need to carry around wads of cash as they traverse Nairobi's clogged and sometimes dangerous streets. Although don't tell the parents of my field workers who are out there about that last comment. <laughs> the research team is working closely with Coke and Equity in reaching more than 1,000 retailers and deploying the product in a way that will allow us to accurately measure its economic impact. Our hope is that what we learn about the credit market in this specific environment can be used to improve the operation of a range of other markets across the economy. Indeed, a sound, secure and efficient financial system will allow African economies to grow not just in size, but in sophistication, as they exploit economies of specialization that go with more elaborate supply chains linked by trade credit. By helping develop deep and efficient financial markets, the bedrock of a modern economy, mobile technology might just, in fact, help make people rich. We're proud to be part of this revolution. Thanks.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Future of Development Assistance panel, moderated by Nina Easton of Fortune Magazine. Well, it's delightful to be here, um, especially with this truly esteemed panel. Uh, I should mention, first of all, that President Kufor is not going to join us. He had a last-minute conflict, but of course we're super delighted to have Gene Sperling here, who, as you've just heard, is not only a uh, senior advisor to the President on all things economic and political as well, uh, but uh, he's somebody who's terribly steeped uh, in this topic of development aid and brings a, a, an enormous perspective to the whole topic. I'm going to introduce our panel before we get started. I'm going to start to my right down here, Paul Collier. He is a director of the Center for Study for African Economies. Uh, and you may know him better as the author of the book, The Bottom Billion, a quite influential look at the effectiveness of development aid and what works and what doesn't work. Steve Radley is chief economist at USAID. Uh, prior to that, he was senior advisor to Secretary of State Clinton on development aid issues. So he brings a broad perspective. We have Gene, of course. And then to my far left, we have um, Chris Polisinski, uh, CEO of Land O'Lakes. Land O'Lakes, of course, is a $18 billion, uh, 13. Farm, $13 billion <laughs> farmer cooperative. Uh, but it's, we, we've been on panels together before. He's uh, a company super active in development aid issues, in fact, in 80 different countries. So thank you for being here. The topic, of course, here is the future of development aid. Uh, things have changed. I don't have to tell this audience enormously. The political environment is challenging at best. You've got uh, economic problems in the US and in Europe. Uh, looking at level funding is probably a, an optimistic uh, point of view. But we've also had a change in uh, types of donors. You have uh, an inclusion going forward. Uh, countries like China and Brazil and India playing more of a role. And you also have private entities like the Gates Foundation and more private companies playing a role. It changes the whole landscape, uh, and I think it, it makes a, a big change going forward. Gene talked about messaging. I'm going to start this panel uh, with a very broad political question, as it were, because I know in this audience you don't think you need, or you may not think that you need to make the case uh, for development aid. Uh, but of course there's a debate within the development aid community of the extremes of Sachs uh, and Easterly. Uh, but I think the case does need to be made. Is it effective? When is it effective? You've got to make that case to, your, to, to donors, to the American people, and, and more broadly speaking, to the world. So with that in mind, I want to turn first to Paul Collier. Uh, is is uh, development aid effective or not? Well, I think if we move beyond the sort of polarized theatrics to, uh, to actually the real world, <laughs> um, the, uh, the reality is that um, aid agencies will increasingly be concentrated on the poorest and most difficult environments. Very obviously, the future of development agencies is not in India. It's in Liberia, Sierra Leone, the Malawi, you know, the countries which are, which are very poor, uh, lack a lot of the institutions necessary for economic development, and are therefore very risky. Um, and so, inevitably, in a risky environment, when you engage, you'll have your failures as well as successes. Now, navigating so that you, you have the, the maximum in, impact within that context is difficult, but f accepting the notion that this is a high-risk environment, your future is, is not safe lending at uh, you know, low interest, uh, secure creditor, status, your future is operating in very risky environments. 
If I could jump in, I think it's, a, it's, it's an important observation. And, and Land O'Lakes lives in, in both worlds, in a sense. We have the commercial business, and then uh, we've been involved in development uh, intensively, as you said. I look at this poll a lot like new products. Uh, failure is part of the, the, the process. And you've got to redefine that and, and not take it as failure, but take it as learning. So the question is development, uh, all development dollars uh, used, are, are they used perfectly? Is every dollar spent effective? The answer is no. And that's okay, as long as you treat it as learning. And you take the learning and revise what you're doing in market. Gene, is that a politically palatable message to take to voters who are feeling cash strapped at home? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Well, I, I think I think as I was saying, um, you know, I mean, I, I think voters, uh, uh, you know, are not monolithic, and, and I think uh, I think you have to make a very strong case. And right now, when times are very, very tough, I think you have to make a strong case um, at any point. And so, I think it is uh, quite incumbent on those who want to see the most development assistance to essentially be the ones who are the most rigorous, the most uh, uh, data-driven. Um, and, and I think what you said is very important, which is, and, and I, I believe this virtually in all types of, of, of public investment, that uh, to, uh, to try to be in a situation where you're acknowledging the issue is so great, but not being defensive, and I think that's the problem you, you have, is that you say, well, I care so much about girls' education that I don't want to admit failure in a particular program because I think it will under, undermine the entire enterprise. And so what happens is you try to marshal support to defend it. So you need, uh, I think, to be in a position where you're willing to acknowledge uh, when things are not working, but that the problem is, is, is compelling enough that you want to stay at it. Now, I think you're right, though. There's risk. There is risk that those who are against any development assistance will seek to exploit any failure as not learning. Uh, uh, you know, they won't treat it like you would treat uh, something on cancer research where you don't go, oh my God, that experiment failed. You know, we should stop trying to prevent cancer. Uh, you say, well, then let's try a different tactic. That's what we have to try to do. And I think you have to be in that position as an, as an advocate. Look, I mean, you, you've got the polar extremes. On one hand, uh, when you uh, are pouring money into a system that is not working, um, you've not only not used that money well, you do uh, decrease public support because that does become a, uh, a weapon against overall development. On the other hand, Bill Clinton used to have a saying, which is, whenever somebody tells you the issue is not about money, the only thing you know is that they're talking about <laughs> somebody about else's money. problem. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, how do you answer critics uh, like an Easterly who say there's really no evidence <laughs> that uh, aid on a macro or micro level is effective long term? With great patience, at least I try. Um, I really think that this uh, polarized debate between the Easterly camp uh, which I think is populated by one or perhaps a few others, and the Sachs camp, which is populated by one or a few others, has really gotten us off track over the last few years because uh, I'm, Paul and I both are asked all the time, which camp are you in, which is ridiculous. And I think most people who work in development are really uh, neither. Um, one of the problems with the question, the way it's usually asked is, effective at what? Aid is trying to achieve many different types of objectives. And, uh, Easterly's work makes the mistake of just assuming that it's all about economic growth and then disproving that it, that it affects economic growth. When humanitarian assistance is not about economic growth, uh, getting immunizations, vaccines to children is not about economic growth. Getting kids in school is about economic growth, but 25 uh, years from now. So uh, you have to be careful and, and think through effective at what. That brings you to thinking hard about monitoring and evaluation and, and, and uh, uh, thinking about results and how we structure our aid programs to get at, uh, uh, to get at, uh, uh, at the particular results that we're trying to achieve. The overall evidence from the vast amount of, of research that's been done on the topic shows that aid has a modest overall positive impact on development outcomes. It's positive, it's modest, with a lot of variance. That tells us a couple of things. First of all, there's a lot of other things that are far more important in achieving development goals. Most importantly, the actions that, that our partner countries themselves take. 
Uh, aid at most can help them along that journey, but aid is not the determinant factor. But second, the variance around it does mean that sometimes it works and sometimes it fails. And Chris made this point, and we've got to recognize that. That means that we can improve on what we do, but it also recognizes that we work in risky environments. And sometimes it makes sense to go in and make those investments even when the risks are high that we fail. And if we fail, it doesn't mean it was the bad decision. Uh, a lot of this is thinking of aid as venture capital. You've got to take risks. Development is a risky business. Uh, and overall, we want to have, uh, be driven by results and see what we're trying to do, but also be willing to take the, risk, the risks that are inherent in development. Give us a couple of examples. Well, for example, I'll give you a very good example. We had President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf here uh, over the last couple of days. In 2003, when the war ended and a transitional government went in there, and in 2005, when she was elected, it was far from clear that Liberia was going to make the progress that it has made since then. It was a very, very sensible bet uh, to go in there and try, but the risks were very high, and there was no guarantee that it would work. We face a very, very similar situation in South Sudan today, very risky. Uh, but with the new uh, independence of South Sudan from last year, uh, this is the opportunity where South Sudan can get on its feet. You know, the risks are very high. It may not work. At the moment, it is not looking very good. But that doesn't mean that it's not worth making, uh, uh, making the, 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 the investments and hoping uh, for the best and, and really uh, and, and seeing how it goes. But these are very risky situations. And you can't sit back and only invest in the ones that are sure bets, because then you'd wait and you'd only be investing you know, in, uh, in Ghana once it reaches $1,500 of income per person, which, which would mean we wouldn't, uh, it, would, it just would, would, uh, would really question why we're in business at all. So Paul, you know, going forward, we, ha we do have to look at what works and what doesn't work. And you've written extensively about this. And you focus a lot on the role of both bad, government, gov bad governance and civil war in undermining the effectiveness of aid. Tell us what you find. Yeah, I mean, I, first, I, I, I just agree with Steve. You've, you've, you've got to take risks in these, certainly these post-conflict environments. A good example of successful aid in a post-conflict environment, Rwanda. Think of Rwanda coming out of genocide in 1994. It's got so many negatives that you think this is going to be a disaster. Right? People associate Rwanda in 1994 just with this, this terrible phenomenon. It's landlocked, it's overpopulated, it's no valuable natural resources, it's ethnically divided. This looks a total nightmare. Big aid to Rwanda over the last 18 years has been part of the story of Rwandan success. We know success. The last five years, we've actually had independent, very carefully done household surveys, five years apart. Rwanda achieved the fastest growth of growth rate of poverty reduction in the world, right up there on a par with China, despite all the negatives. Now, in doing that, was, was the fact that over the last 18 years, um, basic institutions of effective governance, economic governance, have been built. Um, and so the, the Rwandan government is good at implementing the basic things, especially in rural areas. Um, what can aid do in these post-conflict environments? Uh, I think it can, can help, first of all, money matters in these environments. Rwanda was very short of money as all these post-conflict environments are. They have no tax base. And so it's either aid money or nothing for these governments. Um, well, aid money, nothing, or one thing worse, which is natural resource crooks. You can sell the future of your country. And that's the default option. Um, trying to build the basic institutions of good economic governance so that money flows cleanly through budgets, donors in post-conflict environments have a lot of leverage there, a lot of opportunity to build the capacity and indeed insist on good practice. Um, so that's the sort of thing which really matters. If we don't do that, then it's not that our aid is wasted, it's much worse than that, our aid is captured by the very people who are the crooks. So aid with your eyes closed can indeed be part of the problem, but it doesn't have to be. 
So Chris, parse this for me. I mean, you've got some of you talking about the importance of investing in risky environments and post-conflict environments, and yet you don't want to waste taxpayer dollars. Um, you've got an agency like the MCC, which invests in good governance, your reference to Ghana, um, forces countries to meet certain measurements of good governance and corruption and so on. What, um, where do you parse that line? I, I think the, this whole conversation points to the respective roles. Uh, first, I'd really like to applaud uh, where development is going, a more inclusive approach, which includes uh, government agencies, the private sector, NGOs, civil society, makes all the sense in the world. We can scale our efforts. But there are distinct roles that emerge. And then Paul talked about post-conflict areas. Uh, those are areas where uh, I think uniquely some of the traditional development organizations have the most impact. Uh, private sector isn't going to really go into those areas until, until there's more stability. So I think a very clear focus on roles and whose responsibility uh, it is to do certain things is part of the solution. Uh, making sure there is uh, good infrastructure, uh, that there's a rule of law, kind of prepares the area for further investment, if you will. Uh, and I think that's the takeaway from this notion of uh, a new approach to development, which is much more inclusive and brings in a broader array of, of um, parties. Gene? Um, you know, as someone who worked in education, uh, it, it is very difficult dealing with the resource issue, and it's very hard to go to um, the poorest uh, areas in the poorest countries and say, geez, uh, you know, we shouldn't be overemphasizing resources uh, because uh, there is no, uh, you know, there are just certain basic costs that you deal with in terms of schools and chairs and teacher salaries, et cetera. And uh, it can seem almost laughable at times to go someplace and suggest, well, there's not a resource problem there. In fact, I think most of us have had the experience of wanting to write a check when you're there um, because you see so many girls who could be going to school if they simply had, uh, you know, $60 a year to go, or, you know, then what are the resources that would allow the government not to charge fees for, uh, uh, you know, upper primary school, et cetera, and not feel that it is a resource issue. Yet, on the other hand, in the same area of education, you do have money flowing into the official sector where, uh, uh, where you often do not have the transparency, you do not often have the rigor, you do not have the confidence that money co flows from the central government to individual schools, et cetera. Um, and, and then I think that's a, you know, the type of tension uh, that you unavoidably have to deal with. And, and I think having a certain degree of link, you know, having the linkage is essentially appropriate uh, to acknowledge that resources matter, but to also acknowledge that we we cannot risk uh, uh, putting funds into a black hole or that it undermines the enterprise for a government that could have a proper implementation of an education strategy to create, to have lost resources or diminish the enterprise. I do think that you do have to think about the different roles in different situations. Um, when you look at, you know, for example, let's say education and you're looking at the conflict, close conflict, um, it's pretty hard, I have to say, at a bit of a moral perspective to say, well, you know, if, you know, if you've had a large group of people, young people, who have been through, been completely dis, dis, uh, rooted from their homes, who have watched family members uh, uh, killed, uh, who are in a state of trauma, that it's kind of like a bad use of money to spend education on them. That, I mean, I, I just a personal and a moral point of view, I think that's not only wrong, uh, but it, it, you also are missing uh, what can be the highest return. Uh, does that, there's, there's a, a beautiful line in uh, 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 the uh, book, what is, what is the What, where the person says to the kids in a camp, uh, right now your brothers are fighting the battle uh, with swords. Uh, you, will, you will win the peace uh, with your books. 
And uh, so, you know, to, to sit there, and that is one of the most difficult situations to try to put education money in. There's often not a functioning government. So the question is, do you ignore it, or do you say at that moment the strategy maybe is to rely more on nonprofits, rely more on the UNICEF, but then, re then figure out how do you make sure you're not displacing the potential for the government to come forward and be the recipient, but have kind of a ramp up where as these processes are put in place as confidence build, building matters, or what I used to call restoring trust gaps in uh, uh, donor assistance are closed, that you make the transition. So, uh, you know, I do feel that you, you have to sit there again and look at what is the appropriate roles at appropriate times. But I think in the end of the day, you want to be moving in a, uh, to the ultimate on-ramp, which is where you have functioning governments that are transparent and functioning, and where there's a country-owned plan, and that all those who are participating are trying to find their role in one coordinated plan. But uh, uh, again, that, is, that may be the ultimate goal for uh, development assistance, but I think you have to have an on-ramp strategy for that. I want to turn to the role of the private sector in just a moment, but let me finish with Steve on this conversation. Um, you know, we've, we really do, you have to, though, make the conversation about how to, rules of the road for effective use of aid in this time of limited resources. Right. What have you learned? And what do you, what do you tell people going forward? Right. Well, so w what we've learned uh, is that, uh, that, first of all, aid can be effective, but we have to have clear goals in terms of what we're operating towards. Now, this is a very challenging thing. That sounds simple. That sounds, it rolls right off your tongue. But in development, you've got a tension between very long-term goals, which is what development is all about, and the need to achieve short-term progress because our funders and our taxpayers want to see it. So you have to set goals. Uh, as we heard yesterday, there was some discussion about this. Judith Roden made this point, that you have to have short-term goals that lead to your long-term goals. But you have to be clear about, uh, 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 about what you're doing. And we have to be transparent about what has worked and what hasn't worked. Because part of it is ourselves. We haven't been as transparent as what we need to do. But the real challenge here is looking forward. Because it's great to look back and see what's been successful. But as successful as it has been, the old models of aid are not going to work in the future, in my view. The world is changing too fast and in too many fundamental ways. That even if we've been doing it right over the last 20 years, we're going to have to change. Why? First of all, private sector flows today are dwarfing. Uh, foreign aid. Private sector flows to developing countries grew from $150 billion in 2001 to over a trillion dollars today. So there's huge growth and there's a lot more where that came from. Uh, second, we are facing funding constraints. Whereas over the last 10 years, we've been in this wonderful situation where funding has grown and we've been able to add PEPFAR and the Millennium Challenge Corporation and lots of other things. That's not the future. So we have to be much more clever with our aid. Third, there are far more democracies out there uh, in terms of developing country partners than there were 20 years ago. Far more uh, responsible governments that we can partner with, which must mean we have to change how we interact with those governments. But not all are democracies. So we're going to need different mechanisms for different kinds of countries. Those that are our democracies uh, require and demand and should have one way that we interact with them. Those that are not democracies, where frankly uh, some of the governments are still not particularly responsible, requires a different kind of, of, of mechanism. And then uh, finally, there are lots of new partners out there uh, it, that didn't exist 10 years ago. There's, uh, there's new donors like China, Saudi Arabia, uh, India coming to the fore. There are uh, uh, new foundations, the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the Nike Foundation, lots of new foundations that didn't exist before. So we're going to, whatever the mechanisms that worked in the past, we need to be very clever and creative and innovative uh, because we're facing a whole new world in the next 10 years. And if we try to just base what we're doing on the success of old models, I'm not sure we're going to continue to be successful in the future. Can you briefly go through just those countries you mentioned and Talk about what distinguishes their uh, delivery of aid, China, Saudi Arabia. Well, a lot of them, they're, they're, we're not so good at being transparent. They're, uh, they're even worse in some ways. So we don't exactly, uh, exactly know a lot. But, but 
uh, China's model is much more uh, commercially oriented in terms of trying to support some of the investments that they're making, uh, either directly uh, investing in things like plantation agriculture or extraction of natural resources or the infrastructure that can support that. Uh, that's not all bad. Matter of fact, that can be a really good thing. Uh, and it's not like in, in the history that we have not been about extracting natural resources ourselves. Um, but it is much more of a commercial model. They're less likely to be involved in health and education, although they do some work there. Um, uh, and uh, by and large, the emerging donors tend to have fewer conditions. We have uh, grown over the, over the past several decades adding different, new and different kinds of conditions. And sometimes we overburden ourselves, I think, with too many conditions on economic policies, on governance, on, 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 uh, on various policies. There are good reasons to do that, but sometimes our list is too long. Uh, and it be, can be, uh, become a little bit burdensome uh, in terms of the delivery of aid. Is that true, Paul? And secondly, how effective is that, that those private sector flows that Steve made a reference to? Yeah, I mean, the, the great Nobel Prize winning economist uh, Tim Bergen came up with a very powerful idea. It's called Tim Bergen's Rule. And that is, however many objectives you have, you need at least as many policy instruments as you have objectives. If you've got more policy objectives than you have instruments, you can't achieve all your objectives. Now, development assistance has been festooned with objectives. We keep adding them at a rate of knots. And we've had one instrument. How much money do we put where? And that scenario, Tim Bergen would say, is doomed. So you've got to slim down the objectives. I would say you, can slim, you can't slim it to less than two. You want to respond to need, and you want to be effective. But if you've got need and effectiveness, then you need two instruments. Um, if you only have one instrument, how much money, you'll just bounce between putting the money to the needy and finding you're ineffective, putting the money to where it's effective and finding you're not meeting needs. So you need two instruments. And what are the instruments? Well, one is how much money you use, but the other is the modalities by which you deliver aid. And we need much more innovation in the modalities of delivery. This was basically what Steve was saying, that you need different approaches. What works in Ghana will not work in Sierra Leone. And so you need, we, we, we've developed quite good ways of working in environments like Ghana, but unfortunately, the future is not the Ghanas of the wor this world. The future is the Sierra Leones, the countries which are really quite deeply challenged and flawed. And, you know, like Tolstoy's unhappy families, unhappy countries are different all one from another. So what works in, in Sierra Leone won't work in Yemen. So you need to develop a portfolio of instruments of what works, how you can deliver aid and achieve effectiveness in difficult environments. And we haven't done that. And you suggested. haven't done that yet. You know, we've, we've still been, the Millennium Challenge account was very much in the modality of forget needs, let's go where we know it can be effective. Uh, and that was yesterday's solution. There are a couple of guys called Collier and Dollar who solved that problem about 10 years ago, and one of them wishes he hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to technology, Chris, um, on, a, 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 on a brighter note. The role of technology moving forward, how is that going to change the nature of foreign aid? Well, I think uh, technology is essential, because if you really step back, and, and I look at this through the lens of agriculture and food, we, we already know the answer. We're going to have to produce a lot more food, 70% uh, more food. Uh, by mid-century with, uh, with very limited resources. Uh, and technology is, is the answer. And I think to, to a very real degree, this gets back to this more inclusive, inclusive approach of development and roles and responsibility. How do we use traditional development agencies to uh, work in areas um, that uh, commercial uh, organizations aren't going to invest. And, and we see this with, you know, we're not any smarter than anybody else, but we, we've got both worlds. We've got a commercial business and a, and a development business. And I think if we're very clear about 
roles. The traditional development agencies working in countries around primary infrastructure, around the rule of law, around creating uh, an orderly environment to make investments and, and even priming the pump. That opens the door for private enterprise to think more aggressively about investing and exposing risk capital to, to develop further. So I, I think that innovation and the role of technology is essential to moving forward. And again, through the lens of agriculture, but I think broadly speaking in, in all areas of development. Uh, but, but we have to be more crisp about roles and responsibilities to make sure that investment goes to the countries most in need. Because right now, where is that commercial investment going to flow? It's going to flow to where the risk reward makes most sense. And that's going to be countries that aren't the most desperate. So let's, let's step back. And again, uh, Paul, I like what you said that we need to think about, uh, in a sense, simplifying and focusing. I don't know what the right cliche is, but let's not lose the forest for the trees or less is more, something in that order. Uh, let's, let's really step back and say, where are the countries most in need? And, and who's got what role? And how do we make those countries attractive over time for investments from the private sector? Because then I think we're creating an environment that you'll see that investment in technology uh, that is is going to be the solution. We have got to produce more with less. Before we joined the panel, you were telling me about the, the problems in some cases of acceptance of technology. Yeah, I, I think another role that uh, development agencies can play, and again, we're not any smarter than anybody else, but we see it because we're in commercial and, and development, um, is, is just to be advocates of technology. Uh, technology in healthcare, uh, which carries huge benefits and, and some risks, and even technology in food production. Uh, right here in North America, we've got one of the greatest productivity stories, uh, I think, of all time in terms of what uh, uh, farmers have done. Uh, farmers, uh, a generation and a half ago, one farmer fed 10 people. Today, one farmer feeds uh, 150 people. Uh, we've seen corn yields triple, wheat yields triple. Uh, we're growing six and a half times more corn on our most productive, in 13% fewer acres. Great story about feeding the world, great story about sustainability. Yet if you go into North America, technology is a little scary. It's safe, proven technology. It's working. So I think the role of development agencies can even extend beyond kind of the traditional mindset of working in overseas environments, but working broadly uh, to uh, get most folks aware of how important technology is, not just to our lives, but to the developing world. There's a, a, a if you start from, uh, you know, what is one of the main forces behind development, there's a case to be made that technology is the key driver uh, behind human development, not just in what we now think of developing countries, but since the Industrial Revolution. And if that's the case, then it really does make a lot of sense for, for donors to begin to think about how and where it might make sense to encourage technology. So that's sort of the basic case. There are two different ways to do that. One is to help develop the actual technologies themselves. And sometimes we've done that. We've invested in green revolution technologies, for example, and we're trying to think through new seeds and, and, uh, and fertilizer varieties. Uh, we've invested in health technologies um, uh, uh, over time. We, we invested through one of our partners, JSI, in developing oral rehydration therapy in what is now Bangladesh in the 1960s, which has saved millions of lives around the world. The second role is others develop technology, and the aid donors are helping to uh, disseminate that technology through vaccines, through immunizations, through agricultural extension services, through health clinics, whatever that might be. And we have, to, we have to think carefully about where and when it makes sense to do both of those. There are new ways that we can help encourage investments in new technologies uh, and get private sector investment in those new technologies through things like advanced market commitments and other new devices where essentially donors share some of the risks that private entrepreneurs might take on to get them into uh, new, uh, new areas like vaccines for malaria, which a private sector company would never do on its own because there's no private market for a vaccine for malaria. But if we can help leverage our money to get pharmaceutical companies to use their great uh, uh, advantages and smarts and research cap capacities to develop those vaccines together, we can save millions and millions of lives that are lost in malaria every year. What mistakes have we made? Let me ask you, just to finish up with you, Steve, and go to Paul. What mistakes have you seen made in terms of leveraging private capital? What should be avoided going forward? I can give you a success. Okay. <laughs> I'll take um, it. You know, 
usually it's easier to think of mistakes, but let's, let's, let's take Gene Sperling's point that actually we, what's missing is some good examples of success. Uh, and let's take a really fragile state, Haiti, uh, post-earthquake. Now, this is, this is right up there with post-1994 Rwanda as total nightmare, right? Massive governance failure, massive destruction. This is, this is a nightmare. Um, and what USAID, together with a lot of other donors, has done, it's actually been orchestrated through the State Department, is try and catalyze private investment. Um, I did a little report on Haiti just before the earthquake, where I said that what Haiti needs is jobs. And a good way of getting jobs is to break into uh, garments manufacture. After all, you're sitting just across the sea from the biggest market for garments on Earth. Um, and if America just tweaked its trade policy a bit, made it a little bit more welcoming for garments from Haiti, um, and we provided the, the infrastructure that would support firms, then we might be able to build a garments cluster. Now, that's happened. You know, post -earthquake, the earthquake helped in one respect. It persuaded Congress that it better improve the trade market access for Haiti. So Congress did that in the wake of that earthquake. And then the donors between them put in the infrastructure to build a new city. Because if you think in Haiti, what, you, what we now know is don't put your industry in Port-au-Prince. So they'd created a new city on the north coast. They got the biggest garments firm in the world, South Korean firm, to commit, in the first instance, 20,000 jobs. And on the back of that commitment, there's got to be a whole cluster of other firms and supporting services come in. So this is going to be a new city in a safe area free of earthquakes. It took a lot of coordination, but it was with, without the public sector intervention, that Korean firm wouldn't in a million years have moved to a greenfield site in northern Haiti. So it's a success. Um, the, the, as we think about this, I think we've got to think through how we can do this. Paul's given one example. There are several ways that donors, I think, can be helpful in encouraging private sector without crossing the line into subsidizing uh, the profits uh, 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 with private sector investment. We can cover uh, costs of due diligence and assessments. For example, when energy firms come in, uh, and, and there might be five or six energy companies, electricity companies, that might be uh, thinking about a hydro uh, uh, investment. They've all got to undertake the same assessments and due diligence. Well, four out of the five are going to be wasting their money. So perhaps that's a role for a public agency, is to do those assessments for them and make those a public good. That's one kind of thing. A second is supply chain linkages, which Chris can talk a lot about, where we as donors can work with agricultural co-ops that if they get their quality standards up, then a private company will buy for them. And we're doing this with Land O'Lakes, we're doing this with uh, PepsiCo in Ethiopia, we're doing this with Starbucks, where we don't work directly with those companies, but we cooperate with them and we help the co-ops to meet the standards that Starbucks or Land O'Lakes or PepsiCo would buy from them. Uh, a third we heard about yesterday with uh, Vikram Pandit uh, on mobile money is that we can help with collective action problems. There's a big collective action problem with mobile money. The banks won't go unless there's a market. The market won't develop unless they know the banks are in. So we need some coordination to get around that collective action problem. So we're working with Citigroup, as you heard yesterday, to put $23 million into mobile money platforms to help encourage that. And then fourth and finally, we can do things around risk guarantees and co-financing like OPIC does or the IFC, One Wing of the World Bank, where we're actually co-investing with the private sector to cover some of those risks. So there's, there's other things as well, and Gene can add to this because he's thought a lot about this as well. But those are the kinds of things that I think over the next 10 years, if foreign assistance given how limited it's going to be, is going to multiply its impact. It's got to find new innovative ways to work with the private sector to leverage its investments. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, look, let's just be honest. In our own country, uh, you know, greatest economic challenge other than recovering from the crisis is how we shape growth and productivity in a way where the benefits are widespread. We're, we consider this a major struggle. 
Um, when you talk about the major private sector flows that are now coming in, this obviously can be a, an excuse for doing less on development, uh, uh, you know, to say, well, you know, the role of development is, is, is less important right now. What, what I like and what Steve has said, and I think has been the Obama administration view, is that it offers an opportunity to try to, to catalyze or help shape uh, not just attract, but shape that uh, private sector flows in ways that are promoting of self-sustaining income growth and development. You, you know, what, one uh, thing I remember at the end of the Clinton administration was we decided to look one day about this issue of, of technology being accessible to people with disabilities. And we brought in a lot of the top scientists in the government or people working on it, and they said something. They said, you know, um, if, if you're creating something at the beginning and you know you're supposed to create it in this way, it's really not that hard. It's incredibly hard to take what we've already done and go back. I think to the degree that USAID, that, that Clean Global Initiative, others work in this area, think about how you set templates and models so that people as they are having their private sector flows have uh, that somebody has helped think through for them. Here is how you can do good and do well at the same time. If somebody is coming in and uh, they're going through the normal, uh, you know, uh, looking at their returns of an investment somewhere, for somebody to be there, for the U.S. government and others to play a catalyzing role in saying, you're going to need a certain type of supplier. You're going to need them anyways. Here's a way you can do it in a way that will be very positive. You'll be contributing to the growth. And we can help. It's not all on you. We can help uh, create the standards. If you are clear what the standards are, we can help create them. Um, if you uh, uh, need a certain number of people to be educated, we can try to work with uh, a, a local school, a local college. Now, when you're doing that, you are uh, uh, you're not just saying, well, there's great private sector flows. You're thinking about how we play a role in catalyzing the shape of that in a way that is creating more entrepreneurs who will go on. And you're also leaving something there. If you, um, I was proud to be at the beginning and helping to shape what was the Goldman Sachs 10,000 uh, uh, women initiative. And one of the things we thought about at the beginning was, do you just set up your own little program or do you work with local business schools in different developing countries. If you do the following and you create a certificate program and it's a strong certificate program and it's, you're getting companies to link in with that, even when your money flow ends from a particular private sector donor, you have left something there. You have helped develop uh, a business certificate program that can go on. You have helped build the skills. You have helped build a sister private school partnership. And I think that this is the type of thing, going back to the uh, people, the scientists we were talking about at the beginning, technology, where I think that if people are, uh, uh, if we can play a greater role, if foundations can play a better, greater role in helping somebody think through, here's, uh, uh, you know, you know you're, you're going to make a profit, but here's how you can do it, here's how you can do well uh, um, for yourselves in ways that are also good for the country you're at and why in the long term that will be good for everyone. To have thought through that and to play that catalyzing role I think is, is, is one of the most promising ways that the private sector and government can uh, uh, take these large flows of money that can dwarf development assistance but not just say, oh, they're so big, who cares? But how do you shape them in a way where the growth is shared where the development is shared, which has not been the historical success often of U.S. private sector investment in some of the poor areas of the world. Chris, does, do, do, does the private sector need Washington guidance on this? Well, yeah, I had two, uh, two comments. First, I, I want to underline what Gene said. The role of traditional development agencies is as important, if not more important uh, now than ever, because we do have a trillion dollars of money or some such number, more than a trillion, as Steve said, coming in from the private sector, but shaping that investment. That money's not gonna naturally flow to the areas most in need. It's not gonna naturally flow to those post-conflict areas. It's not gonna naturally flow to the biggest challenges. So development, and it's back to roles and responsibility. I think traditional development agencies, that's a focus area to prepare those areas for investment. 
that's critical. And I think the role is very, very important, as important as ever. And we can't lose that as dollars come in, because the dollars are going to flow to relatively low risk, relatively higher return areas. It's just going to work that way. Uh, I also want to outline back to your initial question some of the challenges. Uh, and I don't know if this is a, a failure as much as it is a learning. Um, and, I, and I'll look at Land Lakes, and again, we live in both worlds. Uh, we, we have a program, and I mentioned it in another panel, but it's worth mentioning again in Malawi. It's a, it's a raging success. Uh, we have, it's a supply chain program. We give cows to individual Malawian women farmers. They go from um, uh, poverty to a version of wealth. They make good money. We connect to buy fertilizer, send their kids to school, access health, health care. We link uh, uh, several uh, uh, smallholder farmers to a collection station. We ensure the quality. We link it to a marketplace. Uh, I think uh, two, two to four million of USA dollars has been multiplied uh, several times by local investment, and we can stop right there and say, what a great success. Or the learning is, we haven't thought big enough. There's the humanitarian impact we've had, which is terrific, but what about reframing that project to say what we've really done is create a high quality raw material supply in an attractive future growth market for the beverage industry and now uh, access at an earlier stage those private sector uh, mindsets and dollars to come in and be co-investors. I think that's another, it's a learning. It is not a failure. It is a learning of how we can think bigger in our development activity. Running short of time, I want to go to a crowd hall question and a question from the audience. The environment surrounding NGOs seems to be shifting to one of distrust among those giving financial support and those receiving the needed assistance. How can the quality of non-government organizations be improved to assure better outcomes and a community of trust? Quickly, Paul. Yeah. The, the, the epicenter of distrust is the one capital flow that is going to fragile states, and that is uh, for natural resource extraction. That is the big phenomenon in fragile states. This is the trillion dollars that will flow into and out of fragile states. And if history repeats itself, that'll be a disaster. And so, um, I mean, Jean Sperling is absolutely right that there's guidelines here can create sort of mental shorthands, um, which are very useful in, in trying to live, avoid repeating past mistakes. And so what aid can do to make uh, the, the, the vast flows of money going into and out of these fragile states for natural resources more successful than in the past is providing that guidance on getting the decision chain right so that natural resources become a solution rather than a nightmare. Um, getting that decision chain clear both for governments, building the capacity along that decision chain, and building awareness in civil society. Now, NGOs can be very useful in doing that. Think, the one instrument we've got at the moment, the, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which came out of 30 kids in an NGO. And that's now making a big difference. So harnessing both the power of NGOs and the, and the power of aid agencies to, to finance the capacity building along that natural resource decision chain, the payoff to that is huge. If we can make this trillion dollars a success instead of a nightmare, the difference is astronomical. We have run short of time, but what I'd like to end on is what I like to call the lightning round. I want to go to each of you. I want, I want you to think, if, to this audience, this very sophisticated audience, if they're thinking about development aid 10, 20 years out, leave us uh, two or three points on smart ways to be thinking about it and approaching it. Let me start with Chris. Clear roles and responsibilities with accountabilities for those roles. What are the roles of traditional development agencies? What are the roles of the increasing investment from the private sector? What are the expectations? And let's hold ourselves accountable. 20 years from now. 10? Um, no, I, I, guess I'll stay with, I guess I'll stay with my, uh, uh, my, uh, my, my last point, which is, is, is um, as a huge amount of flows go in, um, how do we help people shape the flows? 
both so that they have confidence to go into riskier environments, but even when they go into lower risk, uh, um, lower risk environments, uh, 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 people feel that it is part of their mission. The people in the United States back home, their customers will care whether they are functioning in a way that is extractive of, uh, uh, or uh, self-sustaining and building in the areas they are in terms of the suppliers, in terms of their impact on schools, et cetera. I think to create both that ethic, uh, that ethic uh, to create a United States public that cares uh, uh, and for companies to understand people care about their brand, who they are, um, uh, how they are producing their product, uh, uh, how they are received. Uh, I, I, think that, I think that will matter and that will help, I think, drive companies to care more and I think it creates greater roles then for uh, the USAIDs, for the foundations to be able to uh, uh, help not in a heavy-handed way, but in a guiding hand, uh, uh, lay, lay foundation, show where there's partnerships, show where there's mutual interest in doing things that are, are, are fundamentally um, uh, uh, self-sustaining. And, and on just on your last issue, the question, uh, I guess, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a friend of mine, but, uh, <laughs> but when we wrote on, uh, uh, on education and post-conflict, the whole idea was closing the trust gaps. And the fact is that Remember that governments in conflict, post-conflict situations fear not only that their money will be wasted, but that their money could actually be used in negative ways. And the role at that point for the NGOs or the, the UNICEFs or to, be, to essentially close those trust gaps, um, because I think so many times people see there and they want to help but they worry their money will be wasted or their money that will even be used for armed conflict in ways they don't understand. To be the NGO that has trust and to be able to say, we are there, we are monitoring, you can trust, I think that can close very important trust gaps uh, uh, in periods where people uh, uh, care deeply about the people of a conflict-ridden country but have the least confidence uh, uh, in the emerging governments at those times. Three words, uh, transparency, accountability, and partnerships. And we've got to do a lot better on all three of those in the next 20 years. Transparency, so that our taxpayers and the countries that we work with know much more about what we're doing, where we're doing it, and how we're doing it. Uh, accountability, so that we have clear results that we are aiming for. Our partner countries have clear results that we're working with that they're aiming for. Uh, the, uh, the wonderful partners that we work with, our contractors and, and grantees, uh, so many of whom that do great work have clear accountability. And then the third word is partnerships. We've got to work much more creatively with the emerging uh, countries that are getting uh, richer, that are more democratic and have more effective uh, institutions themselves. We've got to partner with them. We've got to partner with the private sector. We've got to partner with the emerging donors and foundations that are out there. And if we can do better around transparency, accountability, and partnerships, I think we can continue to be effective in the next couple of decades. Overarching objective, but over the next 20 years, there should be fewer fragile states. How do we do that? We focus on building the capacity of the governments of fragile states to spend money well. The moment they don't have that capacity, it's a matter of building the capabilities, building the institutions, and finally, focusing on fragile states and their capacity to spend money well really plays into uh, the concerns of ordinary American citizens. Um, this is where we can get an alliance between compassion and self-interest the sort of thing that Dean Sperling spoke about in his, in his talk, that um, there need be no tension between compassion and self-interest, and fragile states is where the two coincide. If there were more fragile states in 20 years instead of less, that is both a humanitarian disaster and a nightmare for America. Well, I hope you can all join me in uh, thanking this fabulous panel. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take a brief refreshment break in the grand hallway downstairs. Our program will resume at 1045.